Hi guys, so in this video we're going to talk about section 4.5 which is combining functions. I wanted to go ahead and do a video instead of a live SI session tonight um, just because I know some people are still without power and um, internet connection and it's kind of spotty so this just guarantees that everybody gets a chance to watch the video. Um, if you have any questions after the video, um, please just email me. I'll be more than willing to answer anything that comes up. Before we actually get to any problems, um, there be there will be certain problems throughout your um, section that will ask you to find the domain or the implied domain. So really quickly, I just wanted to kind of remind you of what you need to do for implied domain. There's basically... Um, three things that you got to ask yourself, um, really two, and then the third one is just a combination. So the first thing you need to always ask yourself when we're talking about do implied domain or domain from a function is, is there a square root? And we're very specific about this. Notice it's a square root, not a cube root. It does have to be a square root in order for it to cause some problems. And the reason that it causes problems is because at this moment, we've not really talked about what happens with the square root being negative. So we don't wanna have the square root negative. So what we're gonna do um, is every time we see a square root, we're going to take whatever's underneath the square root, uh, which we actually call the radican. So we're gonna take whatever's underneath the square root and we're going to set it greater than or equal to zero and solve. Most of the time, your answers for this are going to look like this. They're going to be a bracket with some number value, comma to infinity, um, or it could be the opposite. It could be going to negative infinity, um, comma, and a bracket here with the number. The vast majority of your homework will look like this first option. Um, with it going out to positive infinity. I just need you to understand it could go the opposite direction depending on the signs of what we have in our problem. But again, the vast majority of yours will look like the first one. The second thing we have to kind of consider when we're talking about domain and the questions we need to ask ourselves is, is there a variable in the denominator? So this causes a problem because we cannot let the denominator of our fraction be zero. Um, we can't divide by zero. If you want to see something funny, just ask your Siri what zero divided by zero is. It's a nice, funny response, but it helps you remember we can't actually divide by zero. Um, so what we're going to do in this case is we are going to set the denominator equal to zero and solve. I know it seems kind of weird that we don't want it to be zero, but we set it equal to zero. This just gives us, tells us what that value that we cannot be. Um, we can have more than one restriction or um, number for our denominator that we cannot use. Um, that would happen if we had something like an x squared minus one where we would actually have two distinct answers. The vast majority of yours will have one, but it could have two if the problem had that particular issue. Now these are gonna look a little funny as far as what the domain is gonna look, or the interval notation is gonna look like. Um, it's actually gonna be two distinct um, intervals here. So we're gonna go from negative infinity up to whatever number we get when we solve for our zero, and we're gonna use a parentheses with that number. The reason we're using a parentheses is because this denominator or this zero that, or this number we found that causes our denominator to be zero is the one number we cannot ever use in our denominator. So we're gonna get as close to it as we can, but we can't actually be it. Then you're gonna put a union here. Um, please make sure you're using the union on your keypad on Hawks, not on your keyboard on your computer. Um, the U is not the same thing as the union. So just kind of make sure you're doing that. And then what we're gonna do is follow up the second interval, very similar, pays basically opposite of this first one. We're gonna do our parentheses with a number comma out to infinity. And that's typically what's going, our 
um, interval notation our domain is going to look like when we have a variable in our denominator. So those are kind of our two really big questions. Is there a square root? Is there a variable in the denominator? And the third one is probably the more confusing. Number three is, is there both? So is there both a square root and a variable in the denominator? And I will, um, I believe I have at least one example of where both of these things are occurring within one problem. Now, the problem actually happens is we have two options with this. I'm going to kind of draw a line here so we can see our, both of our options as we're talking about this. One is that the square root and the variable in the denominator happen in the same place. So basically, the square root is in your denominator. So for example, you might have something like this where we have 5x over the square root of x minus 2, okay? So now my denominator x, that's in the bottom. Um, my square root is in the bottom. This is actually a much easier problem than my other option. So all we're going to have to do is we're just going to take um, just this denominator part, this x minus 2. I know that's a little hard to see now that I did that, but we're just going to take that part right there, and we're going to set it greater than zero. Notice we lost the or equal to. Because um, remember in step one or in question one when it was a square root, we said we set it greater than or equal to zero because the square roots can equal zero. That's perfectly fine. But when the second that we move that square root into the denominator, now I have to contend with the fact that I can't let it be zero because I can't have zero in my denominator. So all that really happens is we take away that or equal to and we just say greater than. So for like this particular problem, problem we would say well x minus 2 has to be greater than 0 solving that we would add 2 to both sides and we would end up with x has to be greater than 2 and our interval notation would be a parenthesis at 2 going out to infinity with another parenthesis and um and it's going to be parentheses on both sides again because we just said greater than. We don't have the or equal to. Remember, I can get as close to 2 as possible. I just can't actually be the number 2 because that would cause my square root to be 0. And since it's in the denominator, I can't use the 0. Now, the much harder version of this question, I'm actually using something very similar to what we just did, is where my square root, so let's say my x plus 8 is in the numerator, and in the denominator is, um, let's just put 2x, okay? So now I have both of these things occurring. I have a variable in my denominator with the 2x, and I have a square root in the top. Um, so I've, I've basically got both 1 and 2 happening, but in this case, they're happening in two different locations. My square root is in the top of my fraction. I have a variable in the denominator as well. So what you're going to end up doing with this is you're actually going to do both step 1 and 2 separate from each other, and then we're going to see how those two things interact. So for instance, I'm going to talk about just the top for a second. Remember for my rule number 1, my rule was that I just set the underneath of my square root greater than or equal to 0. So in this case, I would do x plus 8 is greater than or equal to 0, and I would solve that. So we're going to subtract 8. So x is greater than or equal to negative 8. Now, what I want you to do is before we write our interval notation, I'm just going to do a really quick little draft here. Here's my negative 8. I can go to the right of negative 8 out for infinity, and at negative 8, we have a bracket since we are allowing for equality. So that's kind of our what our graph looks like. And I'm drawing the graph for a very specific reason, and that's because I want to look at how the bottom of my interval is going to react or act with this. So for the bottom, I'm doing my second question, which is that I have a variable in my denominator, so I'm just going to set 2x equal to 0, and we're going to solve that by dividing by 2. So x cannot equal 0, okay? I know I didn't put a line through it to say cannot, but that's basically what that's saying. So now what I really want to look at is where does 0 fall 
on my number line as far as its relationship to the number negative eight. If it's to the left of negative eight, then I wouldn't need to worry about it because I've already told you that you're not gonna pick anything. You're, the only numbers you're gonna use are from negative eight to the positive infinity. So if anything fell behind negative eight, so like let's say I had come out with negative 10, that's back there behind negative eight. I don't care about it. It doesn't matter. I've already told you that I'm not picking anything smaller than negative eight. Unfortunately, ours does not. Ours is zero. It's maybe right here. This is our zero. And what's basically happening is now I have this hole right here in my graph where I cannot be zero. And holes in graphs immediately give us a union. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the interval notation for each piece of this. So on the left-hand side, the smallest we can get is negative eight and it can go up to zero with the parentheses. And on the right-hand side, we're gonna start at zero with the parentheses again, because that's my whole, I can't actually be the number zero, and we are gonna go out to infinity, and that will be a parentheses there as well. And that would be my interval notation. I know that that can be a little confusing, but I just wanted to give you guys the option. Um, you may or may not see these in your homework. It just all kinds of depends on how the problems come up for you. But that's my. those are my three things for implied domain. Those are the big three things I have to remember as I'm going through those problems. All right, so now let's actually do some problems from this section. I'm gonna start off with addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and then we're gonna go into what we call composition here in just a second. So problem number one is probably one of the easiest ones in the homework, but it tends to be the most confusing. I think sometimes when we get easy problems, um, we almost overthink them because we think they should be harder. They're really not. So this problem says F at negative two is equal to negative one, and g at negative two is equal to a positive two. So this is gonna be true for my entire question one. I'm gonna have four steps for this question. So I'm gonna name my steps, I'm gonna do step A here. We're going to find f plus g at negative two. And what you need to understand is even though it looks like this and it's kind of a funky way to write this, it's just a shorthand. And all that this is saying is you're gonna do F at negative two. Oops, I gotta put my negative in there. Let's try that again. There we go, negative two plus G at negative two. And really, honestly, it's a substitution at that point. We already know that F at negative two is negative one. We know that g at negative two is positive two, so we're just gonna substitute this in and say, okay, well that's negative one plus two. That's gonna give us a positive one. So there's our answer for the first one, one. So when we do the second one, which is saying we're gonna do f minus g at negative two. Again, all this is saying is you're gonna do f at negative two minus g at negative two. Again, we're just gonna use our substitutions. We already know that f at negative two is negative one, minus g at negative two, which is positive two. Negative one minus two, that's gonna give us negative three, and there's our answer for the second step. We're gonna keep doing this. We're gonna go through each of our operations. So we've done addition, subtraction. The next one we're gonna do is multiplication. So we have f times g, at negative two, so again, this is gonna be f at negative two times g at negative two. And I know that I'm writing out every single step here. I really just, I'm wanting you to understand where all of the numbers and stuff are coming from and what it means to do the addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Obviously, if you understand that, you don't need to write this out every time. Again, I just want you guys to see what everything's happening here. So again, f at negative one, or f at negative two is negative one. G at negative two is positive two. So negative one times positive two is gonna give us a negative two. There's our answer there. And the last one we're gonna do is division. So F divided by G at negative two. Again, this just means we're gonna do F at negative two divided by G at negative two. Again, F at negative two was negative one. 
g at negative 2 was positive 2. I cannot divide negative 1 by 2 evenly. Um, I can't even reduce it, so I would just leave my answer negative 1 half. Okay, so again, all we're doing is taking our two functions, they're giving us the values at negative two, and we're just adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing those two numbers, just really making sure, especially on step B and D, that we are paying attention to who goes first, um, because subtraction and division is not cumulative, which means I can't reverse the orders of the F and the G, so I always need to do the F minus the G and the F divided by the G because that's what it's asking me to do. So I'm just paying attention to that. Okay, the second problem I picked out is very similar, except this time they're actually going to give us the functions. So it's going to say that f of x is equal to the absolute value of x, and it's going to say that g of x is equal to x squared minus 7. So it's actually giving me the functions. It's not just telling me what the values are at that specific number. So I'm still going to do the same thing, though, here. We're going to do f plus g at negative 3. Okay, and again, remember that this just means we're going to do f at negative 3 plus g at negative 3. And one thing you need to understand when you're doing this homework is that the negative 3 doesn't change throughout the entire problem. So what I like to do when I'm doing this particular problem is I'm going to come over here to the side. And this is going to kind of be my scratch work here. And I'm going to go ahead and figure out what f at negative 3 is. I'm just going to do it one time because I don't want to have to do it more than once. So this is going to be the absolute value of negative 3. Remember, absolute value just changes everybody positive. So this is just going to be the number 3. So up here I could say f at negative 3 is equal to 3. We're going to do the same thing with the g. So we're going to do g at negative 3. So this is going to be negative 3 squared minus 7. Remember that we are doing a negative times a negative, so that is going to make that a positive 9 minus 7, which would end up being 2. So g at negative 3 is equal to 2. And we're just going to take those two values. We're going to use these guys right here for the rest of this problem, just like we did on the previous one. We just had to figure out what they were first. All right. So now we're going to say this is going to be 3 plus 2. So my first step, my answer is 5. F plus G at negative 3 gives us a positive 5. So for the second one, we're going to do subtraction. We're going to do F minus G at negative 3. Again, this is going to be f at negative 3 minus g at negative 3. Remember, we already know the values. We know that f at negative 3 is 3 minus g at negative 3, which is 2. So 3 minus 2 would give us 1. So our answer there is 1. Doing the same thing for c, except we're going to do multiplication. So f times g at negative 3. So we're going to do f at negative 3 times g at negative 3. So again, neg f at negative 3 is 3 times g at negative 3, which is 2. And 3 times 2 would give us 6. So there's our answer for step 3. And the last one for step 4 or step d, we're going to do f divided by g at negative 3. So again, remember this is f at negative 3, g at negative 3. So this is going to be 3 divided by 2. Again, we can't reduce that. It's in its lowest format, so we're just going to leave it 3 divided by 2. Okay, so on the first one, they told us what the numbers were that we were using. If we look at the numbers itself, 
On the second one, they gave us the functions. So with a little bit of extra work over here to the side, we figure out what they are at that number and we go through and do the problem exactly like we did the previous one, um, just doing that first. And I always like to do the scratch over here first. Like I said, in your homework, it's gonna use the same number throughout all four steps for this problem. So you don't really wanna to have to plug it in every single step if you can figure it out ahead of time and then just use those numbers as you work through the problem. All right, and the next one, we're still doing our addition and subtraction and all that kind of good stuff, but we're not gonna plug a number in. We're just gonna use the functions as they are. So we're gonna start off with f of x equal to the square root of x plus five. And we're gonna do g of x and that's gonna equal 4x. So on this, for step one, we're gonna do two things, or I'm gonna use A there. We are going to find f plus g at x, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna find the domain of that new function. Now, again, when you do your homework, you won't always have to find the domain. It's very clear when they want you to. Um, because they'll have the f plus g of x box for you to fill in your answer there. And then right below it'll have the domain. The other way it'll do it is it will have you do um, one of the functions first, and then the next step will be to find the domain. So it's very clear when it wants you to do that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do it on almost every problem we work today, just because I want you to get used to finding that domain, especially in some of these functions that are kind of weird or different. All right, so let's first start off with doing this this guy right here, remember this is f of x plus g of x. And really honestly, all this is is a substitution. You know that the f of x function is the square root of x plus five. So we're gonna put that. This is the square root of x plus five. Plus, that's this plus right here. And now I know that the g of x function, that's just the function four x, so I'm gonna add four x to that. And most of the time, that's as far as we can go. We really can't go any further. There's no like terms. I can't add the x that's inside the square root with the x that's outside the square root. That doesn't work because one's inside and one's outside. Um, so really this is all I can do as far as the function itself. This would be my answer for the f plus g of x. Now, the domain. Think about our questions. Does it have a square root? You should be saying, yep, it definitely has a square root. Does it have a variable in the denominator? Nope, doesn't even have a denominator. So we don't really need to worry about question three where we ask if it has both because we already said no to question two. So we're going to take whatever's inside of our square root. So just this x plus five. Remember, I don't care about anything on the outside of it for my domain. We're gonna take that guy right there and we are going to set it greater than or equal to zero. And we're gonna solve this. So we're gonna subtract five from both sides. I'm gonna say that x is greater than or equal to negative five. Remember when we do our domain, we do want it in interval notation, not just in algebraic, which is what it is in currently. So interval notation would mean I would start at negative five with a bracket since we said greater than or equal to. That it's the or equal to that gave me the bracket. And it is going to go out to infinity, which is a parentheses. And this would be the answer for our domain. Okay, so we found our f plus g of x, found our domain. So we're going to use the same two functions. The f of x is equal to the square root of x plus 5. g of x is equal to 4x. And this time, for the second part here, we're going to find f divided by g of x and again we're going to find the domain of those so just so we have it written down remember that f of x equals the square root of x plus 5 and g of x equals 4x okay so again this guy right here we're just doing f of x divided by g of x and again, for the most part, we're not gonna have to do a whole lot of fancy stuff here. We're just taking and substituting in what the f of x function is. So again, f of x, remember he's the square root of x plus five. So on the top here, we're gonna have the square root of x plus five 
divided by whatever my g of x function, in this case it is 4x, and that is actually as far as we can go. There's nothing we can do. We cannot cancel the x's out. Um, two reasons. One is the x in the numerator is underneath our square root, so he's in prison. We can't get him out. Number two, he's actually married to the number five. X plus five is one piece, so we can't break apart the X without using some type of thing like factoring um, or taking out the greatest common factor, which they don't have right now. So it's just, this is it, we're done, okay? As far as that first part of finding F divided by G of X. Now, domain. Here's where it gets a little sticky. This is our um, third question. It has both a square root and it has a variable in the denominator and they are separate from each other. So when we talk about our domain, we're gonna have to talk about them separate. So we're gonna have the x plus five is greater than or equal to zero. And we're gonna talk about the denominator and say, well, four x equal to zero. So we have to do both the top and the bottom of this um, function. So on the top here, we're gonna subtract the five and we're going to get that X is greater than or equal to negative five. And again, I always like to do a number line. This just helps me identify where the answer for the second part of this goes, whether it's to the right of five, so it lies inside of my shaded area, or to the left of five, and I don't really care about it because we've already acknowledged we're not gonna use that number. So we're gonna divide by four here. And so X is going to equal zero. Zero is definitely in my yellow spot here. It's gonna be a big old hole in my graph. So remember, whenever we have a hole in our graph, this is gonna be our union and we're gonna break it up into two pieces to the left and to the right. So on the left-hand side, we're gonna stop at negative five, go up to zero with a parentheses. On the other side, we're gonna start at zero and go to infinity with a parentheses. And this would be our domain for that function. Um, and again, we've got that hole in the graph, that's our union. And that's why our graph is into two different pieces. Okay, so that was a pretty big one as far as the domain on that second part. Let's do one more of these type of problems here. Um, actually, yeah, let's do this one. So this is gonna be, I think, number three, yep. Sorry, guys, So num or number four, I'm sorry. So f of x is going to equal the cube root of x and g of x is going to equal x to the three over two. So one thing I need you to understand is anytime we have a fractional exponent like this, the top is your power, the bottom is your root. So for this one having that bottom of a two, this is a square root. Okay, so this is gonna be a problem for us because it is a square root, which means that we start talking about our domain, we gotta talk about this guy. If you don't like the way that looks with the fractional exponent, you can rewrite that if you want. Um, and you can say that this is g of x equal to the square root of x cubed. Um, if you prefer that particular style over um, the fraction, it doesn't really matter. Both of them are correct. It's just a matter of preference, okay? So we're gonna start off again with doing f plus g at x. Again, remember that this is f of x plus g of x. So in this case, f of x is the cube root of x, while plus g of x, which is x to the three halves. Again, if you don't like having that fraction up there with the three halves, use the square root of x cubed. This means the same thing. Okay, so if we talk about the domain, because this is our answer, we can't do anything to this, we can't actually add those together because they are different roots. One is a cube root, one is a square root, so we're kind of stuck there. But we do need to talk about the domain, okay? And if we talk about that, remember that our questions are, is there a square root? 
and is there a variable under the denominator, and then both. So there's definitely a square root. We just talked about the fact that having that little two in the denominator of my exponent means that this is a square root. So we definitely have that. Um, we do not have a variable in the denominator, so we don't have to worry about that. All we need to do is take this x and set it greater than or equal to zero. So we would say, okay, x is greater than or equal to zero. It's already solved for us. We don't even have to solve it because it's greater than or equal to zero. It's all by itself. So our domain here would be a bracket at zero going to infinity with a parentheses, and that would be our domain answer there. Um, and you might be thinking, well, if I had done it with this one, I would have put the x cubed. That's okay. It's still going to just be zero. Um, the opposite of having something cubed is to take the cube root of it. Um, the cube root of zero is still zero, so it doesn't actually change anything with the power there. Um, and that's just because you have that singular x, um, and you don't have something added or subtracted onto them. If we had something added or subtracted, it'd be a little bit different. But with just a singular x like this, it doesn't really matter what his power is. If he's greater than or equal to zero, the power, no matter what power you put in there, it's still going to be zero. So it's kind of cool. All right. So for question or part two of this question, we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to do division. We're going to do f divided by g at x. Again, remember this is f of x divided by g of x. Uh, this one is going to look a little funny if you do the fractional exponent. So in your, oops, sorry, in your numerator, we're going to have the cube root of x. In the denominator, we're going to have x to the 3 halves. Again, if you don't like the way that looks, then do the cube root of x over the square root of x cubed. Either one of these, either this answer or this answer is completely correct. It is your preference on how you like to look at it. It doesn't matter. Hawk says, yep, both of them work, same answer, okay? Now, this one, we have a square root, again, and we have a variable in our denominator. Okay, we're just really lucky on this one that both of them happen at the same place. My square root and my variable in the denominator are both on the bottom. I don't care about the cube root on the top. Okay, I don't, whenever there's just a plain old x on the top, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care. The only things I care about are square roots and variables in the denominator. So this time, we're going to take the x here. And we're going to set it just greater than zero. Notice again, we take away the or equal to because he's in the denominator and he cannot equal zero. So we're going to have for our domain, x has to be greater than zero. So then when we actually write this out in interval notation, this will be a parentheses at zero going out to infinity. And this would be our answer for the domain. Now you notice that our domains look extremely similar to each other except for in the first one, um, we used a bracket because we were allowed equality with zero. We said, yeah, zero is fine, we don't care. But in the second one, we said, nope, we can't have zero because that means I'm putting a zero in my bottom of my fraction and that does not work. Okay, those are kind of the, as far as the combination ones, I wanted to do the ones that I thought were probably the hardest to do. Um, after that, they're, they're not too bad as far as the, um, the combinations. Typically, they're having you add them and subtract them, and so um, there's not really a lot of things to do to combine the functions together. So really, you're just kind of saying, oh, I'm going to take this function, and I'm going to add it to this function, and that's my answer. And then just making sure you're asking your questions about um, the domain as far as um, is there a square root? Is there a variable in the denominator? Or are there both? Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop this video right now, and then what we're going to do in the next one is we're going to do combining functions, just so you can see some examples of that as well.